study of uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita which we carry out on every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. We are going to go further on our, <coughs> we are going to go further on our study on our second chapter. <coughs> uh, we are, uh, we were on the 52nd uh, sloka uh, which was related to Moha the word Moha Kalilam and uh, that was a, a topic which we are discussing for over two weeks now. Uh, last week because of some reason uh, we could not stream uh, this Pravachan and uh, but there is a recording and I hope it will be put on the line for the people who missed it. So Yadate Moha Kalilam uh, this was the sloka Yadate Moha Kalilam Buddhir Vyati Tarishyati Tadaganta Sinir Vedam Sruta Vyasya Sruta Stacha. This was the sloka. It was telling us uh, about Moha Kalilam. And the word Moha has been used, uh, misused, uh, reused in various ways, and, a, uh, and various uh, schools of thoughts have, uh, have thought about it and uh, interpreted it in different way. And after the interpretation, uh, they have also uh, thought about how to handle it, whether it is good or bad for the life, um, how to, you, how to uh, you know, uh, face it. And uh, we talked about those schools of thought and we understood that uh, moha, uh, we have to do the tarishyati, means we have to uh, swim through it. Uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot keep sitting on the bank of the uh, swamp. Kalilam, it is a marshy land, it is swamp. It is a quagmir. That is what the Moha is told us. So we cannot just keep on one side of the bank. What it means? That we cannot refrain from doing any uh, work. We have to do the karma. We cannot run away from uh, doing a karma. So that was number one. We cannot run away from doing the karma. We have to do because we are embodied uh, soul. We are embodied creatures, and that is why we have to we have to make sure that uh, we work. Otherwise, we cannot live. Then we understood also that we cannot bypass it. Like there is nowhere that we can avoid it, and we can go from the side of it. So we cannot bypass it. That is the second level. Uh, we cannot we cannot just avoid it. And we cannot get a ride. Sometimes we say that, okay, if you cannot bypass it, if you have to go through it, then you take a ride. And uh, taking a ride means what? Taking a ride means uh, take out, taking help of something which can swim through, which can float over it, like a boat, uh, like a raft. So in the Moha Kalina, we cannot do that. We have to go through it ourselves. We cannot take a ride. Taking a ride in an example is nothing but the guru part. That is where we were also talking. That understanding and taking help of someone to handle the moha, uh, somebody who has already uh, uh, resolved the problem of moha in their life. And we understood that uh, we cannot, uh, we can get a guideline, we can get a guidance from them, but we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, sit on them, we cannot ride on them. Because this is supposed to be done by us. The moha is within. And that is why it is something like if we see somebody doing an exercise, somebody is doing a, uh, somebody is doing a, um, you know, a workout, will not help to improve my health, to improve my body. It will not make me uh, a good muscle person. 
just by watching someone we cannot make ourselves a uh, good uh, um, uh, person so uh, the problem here is that uh, having a guru will be able to guide us will be able to um, uh, will be able to uh, show us the path probably uh, but we will not be able to uh, we will not be able to uh, uh, the, the remove the moha from our own mind from our own uh, uh, greed and other things will not be resolved uh, uh, just by uh, reading those books so somebody will say us that oh moha nikalna hai yeah if you want to get rid of all these things you read good books you uh, follow some guru yeah they will give us they will give us an idea but the workout has to be done by us there is no other way we can Uh, 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 go through it. So that means we cannot take a ride. That is the meaning of taking a ride, or uh, taking a ride of a boat ride to go through the uh, river. It is not possible that way. And we cannot sink into it. Somebody will say, "Okay, we will go like a fish. A fish goes into it and then swims through it." We cannot. Once we go in into the marshy land, remember, it is it is not like a water. It is a marshy land. It is a slam. So. when we go into it it will pull us in and it will suffocate us and we will die into it dying in moha means what actually living dying in moha means actually we will be living we will be living in a way which is more connected to the our uh, uh, sensual happiness in the life and when we do that what will happen we are sink into it sinking into it so that is also not possible so regarding that moha we talked uh, in a detail and with various examples and uh, uh, having a guru uh, it is good to have a guru but remember there are uh, two parts in it uh, one is that uh, every human has a limitation that is a fact uh, except some great people who have come adi shankaracharya and all uh, every human has a limitation so uh, having a perfect person and then having them as a guru is not possible somebody telling that oh, i will have a perfect person and then only i will do it it's not possible number one and number two part is uh, when we see the people with uh, those limitations we lose our shraddha we lose our our faith in the uh, our uh, our belief in the uh, thoughts and so even if a person is telling us a good thought even if a person is telling us the right things we will not follow that we will not believe in it so that is another problem so uh, uh, going further on to it and we talked about this in detail last time so we will go further on this shloka as tada gantasi nirvedam tada gantasi gantasi means you shall acquire gantasi means you will acquire you will go to you will reach nirvedam you will reach your nirvedam nirvedam means indifference now this is extremely important word indifference Uh, because it may be understood in a different uh, uh, meaning so indifference means what indifference means one who is not interested uh, indifference in uh, one item or more items or all through the life will a indifferent person look always very sad and not interested does it mean indifference what is when the god is telling tada gantasi nirvedam you will reach an, a state of indifference what is will be the indifference the indifferent person will still be working number one part he will be working hard with the full effort he will be in a state of activeness he will always be in a active position and he will like to achieve something so yes a, a indifferent person doesn't mean that a person will not achieve something so he will have a karma he will have the results he will be putting his full effort into it and he will be uh, the seen as working very hard but he is indifferent from the greed and the result the 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 impact of the result will not happen on that person that is what is indifference and the excellent example we always take is a cashier a cashier gives away you know thousands of dollar every day but he is indifferent he is not touched why because he knows that what is me and i what is mine and others when he knows that this is not mine the bank money is not my money when the cashier knows about it cashier is indifferent he is neutral but the thing is that a human cannot be a neutral like that 
a human needs love needs affection the warmth of family recognition in society so how do we do it how do we become indifferent so indifference is a quality it is not related to any object because there are some people who are indifferent in one area or different area one or the other area so a person can say yeah i am indifferent i am uh, indifferent to this uh, object or i am indifferent to this situation a person can say that i am indifferent but when we say indifferent that means it should be the inherent quality it should be imbibed inside ourselves and that quality will be achieved through the yoga sa as we talked uh, around three shloka before when we understand ourselves when we understand our relationship with the uh, uh, with the outside world uh, we understand the purpose of our birth uh, and we understand uh, what i am actually i am not the body or the senses or what then our our buddhi will become sharper and then that buddhi will make us indifferent to those things which are connected with the moha that is a mechanism <coughs> so it is not connected to the object or any situation it is connected to the inner state of a person and we talked about that as a hydrophobic we took the example of the hydrophobic shoes hydrophobic shoes are indifferent they are not although it's very crude example physical example but it is not it is not uh, touchable it does not get impacted by the water and we can do this by connecting with the yoga the next word is shruta vyasa shruta sesha this is a uh, very important part because what happens that uh, the god is it is interesting to see that god is taking talking about not present but also future <coughs> the future because what will happen today we may not have a moha or aspiration for something but if the things change we may develop aspiration <coughs> we may develop a greed we may develop a moha for it <coughs> a example will be <coughs> a normal example will be uh, if you ask a 16 year old girl that uh, do you have the moha for a kid uh, for the babies uh, she will say no i am interested in watching movies i am interested in you know uh, going out with my friends <coughs> but when the kid becomes older it does uh, it becomes a woman and gets a baby now they develop the moha so it is also possible that today the things which we are not known to me or the things which are not creating moha in me may create moha tomorrow so shruta vyasa shruta sacha whatever are already heard of and whatever you are going to hear in future both these things will not be impacting you and so how does it work it works because we are inherently it is like immunization we develop an immune so that no uh, no uh, no disease no viruses nothing will be able to impact our health when we develop a good immune so indifference here is nothing but a psychological state where we develop an immune towards any kind of moha which are related to the present objects or situation and which may arise in future so somebody will say if i do not know what is going to come in future how do i develop immune for it today and this is very interesting thing even in our uh, medical sciences also we see they give us the uh, in, uh, the you know the uh, flu shot they say that okay this year it may be uh, this will be the version so whatever old flu uh, viruses were there we make the vaccine for it and we give you the vaccine but they do not know what will be the future version of the flu viruses and so they cannot immune us and that is why we have to take flu shots every uh, year twice fall and spring so the in the similar way uh, 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 but those diseases which we already know like smallpox we take it once and then it is for all because we developed the immune for it shruta vyasa shruta sacha means today and in future we should not develop moha is to develop an immune 
to develop a method in mind uh, to develop an attitude uh, towards the life and towards who i am uh, a example is how a washerman uh, trains a donkey dhobi uh, we call this a dhobi kehte hain the uh, uh, the washerman the old man if there is a washerman his uh, donkey has died uh, so what washerman do that uh, washerman cl uh, collects the clothes from the whole village and they wash it on the river bank and then they return it back to the people that is uh, how nobody had a you know washing machine like what you have uh, today in every home all so uh, the, suppose uh, there is a washer and this washer man is collecting the clothes and uh, putting on the back of a donkey and then takes the donkey to the river bank and then they do the cleaning of the clothes now in this uh, whole scenario situation what happens that suppose the donkey died donkey has a less life so donkey will die after say 8 10 years or 12 years now the do the uh, the washerman brings another donkey now the donkey is trained the donkey is trained to go to every home and every home who has got the clothes will put the clothes in a bag in a in a small uh, uh, gutri and they will put it on the back of the donkey and just bit once and the donkey will go to the next door to the next door there is nobody who is guiding the donkey there is nobody who is uh, pulling the donkey from door to door and finally to the river bank the donkey itself goes everywhere now with a new donkey what happens that the donkey doesn't know the route that which way i have to go and which homes i will be standing where i will be standing so this dhobi this guy is taking the donkey and pulling and, pu and stopping the donkey at every door step of the whole village there are small villages they are not very large village around 20 40 families so he will do this around 2 3 days and if the donkey tries to move he punishes it because it's a donkey it's an animal so he punishes it but basically he trains the donkey that his route every day morning is to go out of the house stop at every door step and then reach to the river and then once the clothes are cleaned the he will put the load of the clothes and again beat the donkey once give a whip so donkey now knows that i have to go to my home back the donkey is like a pre-programmed robot he has an attitude he will not change their attitude once he is trained even if there are new homes created in the village or like that he will stop at every doorstep in other words any change in situation will not impact the donkey's behavior donkey is going to so we have to train our mind the, what it means is that that we are not trained for it we have to train our mind to understand what is creating the moha in my mind and intellectually through the yogam we will connect ourselves to a higher values so that anything which is creating a moha in me today or any similar situation or objects coming in future are all not going to impact me and going to create a moha in me that is what is shruta vyasa shruta sutta whatever is hard now or in future you will be immune to it tada gantasi nirvedam you will be immune to it you will be indifferent you will become a indifferent person so does indifferent person uh, become uh, become a sadist does does he become like that no he does not he works hard he does everything and so it is also telling us here that uh, uh, leaving the world is not the method to get indifferent by leaving the world we cannot become indifferent because even if we go to the jungle we will be still having the greed of the things which we have already seen or even in jungle there will be things which we will be seeing new and we will develop a greed for it so getting a indifferent psychology is the solution to it we will go to the next uh, shloka here uh, 53rd shloka of a second chapter shruti vi pratipannate yada sthasyati nischala samadha vachala buddhi tada yoga mavapsasi shruti vipratipanna shruti vipratipanna not allured by the fruitive actions of the vedas 
ते मीन्स यू और योर यदा स्थास्यति निश्चला स्थास्यति रिमेन्स वैन योर निश्चला स्टेड फास्ट वेन यू बी ए स्टेड फास्ट निश्चला अबाउट श्रुति विधि प्रतिपन्नाते द द ट्रूटी सेक्शंस ऑफ द वेदास यू विल नॉट बी एल्योर्ड देन समाधा वचला बुद्धिस देन यू विल एवेस्ट समाधा इन डिवाइन कॉन्शियसनेस समाधि इट इज वेरी पैरल वर्ड इज समाधि समाधि मीन्स सम अधी वी आर कनेक्टेड विथ समथिंग बेटर वी आर कनेक्टिंग विथ समथिंग बिगर वी आर समथिंग गुड क्वालिटी दैट इज समाधा समाधा वचला अव अचला then our mind will be our in in our divine consciousness our mind will be steadfast achala buddhis intellect our intellect will be steadfast in the divine consciousness and tada yogam avapsasi avapsasi you will attain then you will attain the yoga connection this is the meaning of the uh, shloka what we call as a anvay this is the anvay of the shloka when your intellect ceases to be allured by the fruity vexations of the vedas and remains steadfast in divine consciousness you will then attain the state of perfect yoga in hindi we can say that jis kal mein shastriya mat vedo se vichlit hui teri buddhi nischal ho jayegi aur parmatma mein achal ho jayegi us kal mein tu yog ko prapt ho jayega yes so it is it is interesting here that it is telling samadha achala so there are two words here achala and nischal achal and nischal and we will see about it what is the difference of it so the word samadhi is formed with a root as sam which is equilibrium and the means intellect when our brain is intellect intellect our intellect is in equilibrium equilibrium means what it is not getting disturbed so achala which can chala means move achala which, which cannot move which cannot be shaken so samada achala meaning a state of total equilibrium of intellect total into equilibrium of intellect what does it mean it means that it is unshaken one who is steadfast in the higher consciousness and unmoved by the material allurements attains that state of samadhi that is the meaning of samadhi so the word here important is allure we should not get allured by it we may uh, use it consume it experience it but we are not allured by it and how do we not get allured by it with a higher course with a with a with a better understanding of ourselves and that is what we focus on the god somebody people ask why do we need god if i am a good person if i am a Uh, nice person i don't hurt anyone i don't uh, i don't do any bad things uh, i don't have any bad habits uh, i am a honest person and i am a uh, humane person do i need a god here is the answer of it because when we connect with something if there is a child for example and the child is trying to play with a knife for example there is a crawling child a little baby and he thinks that oh this knife is a is a tool toy so it starts uh, uh, somehow it catches a knife and it is holding the knife now you try to pull out the knife from from the baby baby will cry oh because baby will think that this is a toy from for me and somebody is pulling away my toy so how do you get, how do we get the how do we get the uh, knife back from the baby we show another toy when that toy is more alluring when the toy is more attractive the baby will leave the knife and go to that toy we are almost similar when we when we uh, understand in our intellect about the higher cause that is uh, our relationship with the god our relationship and our existence and how we are connected with it then once we understand it then we will not be allured by the other lower things and these lower things includes the shastriya allureness also all the shastriya allureness will also not be going to impact us let us take an example that when somebody thinks that oh i want to do a puja 
well with why when they are doing the puja when they are trying to do a uh, you know uh, trying to do some uh, uh, karmakand they have got if that person is something in the mind like oh i will put say you know this much uh, oil on hanuman ji because i need something then it is not a equilibrium it is a bargaining to love and connect with the god uh, without any reason without any uh, any uh, anything needed he is the way to rightly do the shastriya puja to do the the connection if we are if we are doing anything in the expectation of the return even in the shastriya puja even in following the vedas and rituals it is still a state of non equilibrium a equilibrium will only be achieved so in other words we can say the greed of prasad whatever we are going to get return will still be created even if we are doing the puja or any other such ritual or anything in any religion for that matter in any religion if we are doing any puja or anything in the expectation of the return then our mind is not in equilibrium why because we are allured we are going by the returns of the puja one of the example the, uh, and puja doesn't mean only uh, you know uh, uh, the, you know going to the temple and putting the flowers puja is anything say for example surya namaskar nowadays uh, we say that surya namaskar is very good surya namaskar is good for health surya namaskar improves our in body immune and we develop a good uh, health because of that so somebody will say yeah surya namaskar is good and i want to do surya namaskar and the person does it and the person gets a good health also but the intellect of that person is not in equilibrium why because there is a expectation of return there is a allureness from the results of the action and that is why even though the person becomes Uh, uh, even though the person becomes uh, healthier, the person's habit of not getting allured or or uh, intellect of achieving an equilibrium will not be there, even by doing the Surya Namaskar. But if we say that I want to do Surya Namaskar because I love the God Surya and I want to pray Him, I want to get connected with Him. i want to see that i am talking to him yeah and the meaning of those shloka khagai nama khagai nama you know all this all all this what is the meaning of the khaga what mitrai nama what is the meaning why we call the sun as mitra if we understand it and with that understanding if we do the surya namaskar the impact of the surya namaskar will also happen on our intellect Surya Namaskar will impact our intellect, and we will become our intellect will become in equilibrium. We will not be allured by the moh. So, doing the same puja of Surya Namaskar is going to give me not only the good health, but also try to develop my intellect into a equilibrium. This is what it means. That is why the God told clearly that not allured by the fruitive action of the Vedas. Veda means shastra. Shastras always give us a fruitive action. Any karma will give us a fruitive action. If we do a karma, the karma will give us a result. It will be a fruitive action. But not getting allured by any fruit. The example which we took of the donkey in the first part of the sloka, that when we do not, when we are habitual of not getting allured by anything, even the Vedas. who are giving us the method of puja and karma kand and all we will not be even allured by it because when we are allured by that the purpose of our becoming intellect in equilibrium is not served and that is why we see we are, we sometimes see the people oh this person was going to the temple for last 40 years but still and he is doing so much puja he is doing so much uh, karma kand but still he couldn't get out of his anger he couldn't get rid of his greed he couldn't get rid of his all these bad vices why because the puja is done with a expectation of a return prasad for example prasad is a word means pratisad 
when we do something we are expecting the god to tell us something or give us something when we do that as a return as a expectation of return then it does not improve our situation the status of the intellect and we remain same when we remain same it goes into moha when we go into moha the results come and we compare the results with our moha if the results and there are always variation in the results the outcome is always different than what is expected so when the expectations are not met good or bad plus or minus when they are not met the mind is disturbed and a disturbed mind person cannot live happily that is the mechanism and that is why achieving the equilibrium is extremely important i am not telling here that not do the puja do not do the puja we are not telling here do not do the karmakand we are not telling here do not follow the shastra we have to do it but we have to understand how to do it and why to do it so here this is a sankhya yoga here it is clearly told that sankhya bhakti is using intellect to join with the god sankhya bhakti is using intellect to join with the god understanding him understanding the god through the intellect is the method of connection with the god how to connect with the god intellectually connecting with the god intellectually understanding that we are part of his existence hum uske ansh hain hum parmatma ke ansh hain mame vancho jeevano ke jeeva bhuta sanatana this shloka will come in further in sanskrit here in gita so it is also said clearly here that doing only rituals without brain is not the correct way and effect on the of the rituals should happen on the intellect a human should learn with those things what should a, 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 say for example let us take why this karma kand is there and how how do we learn somebody will say okay these are all theoretical tell me how do i learn how exactly i i i learn uh, what is the methodology and a directive to make uh, my intellect into equilibrium how will i do it so to do that we have to first understand how do the humans learn <clears throat> what is the mechanism of learning if we understand it we follow the same mechanism to teach our intellect to go into equilibrium and achieve the yoga yog means to join we will join with the god <coughs> with the god god so let us try to understand how does a human learn how do we learn the methods of learning so there are five ways in which we learn we learn by trial and error method number 1 we try something we fail or we pass or we get uh, a different a result different than expected then we say aha let us make some corrections the inputs are changed parameters are changed and corrections are put so the cycle is we put the effort we get the results and we evaluate we correct it and we do the effort again and this is connected to the prakruti of a person so what is a prakruti of a person suppose there is a weak person a person who is not that strong and that weak person is trying to lift a very heavy weight he goes to a gym and he thinks that okay today i'm going to weigh, lift 200 pound <clears throat> in whatever way the the person thinks about it changes the methods can that person lift the weight answer is no <clears throat> so depending on the prakruti a person will do the evaluation process some people are brave so they will take higher risk decisions after the evaluation some people are not so they will not take a risky decision some people are very intellectual so they will be able to find another way to do the thing some people are simple their intellect is not that high so they will be taking a different decision in other words the trial and error is dependent on the nature of a person which is called as a prakruti what we call as it so trial and error method is a learning method but it is dependent on the prakruti so with the same experience somebody will say let us do it again suppose a person goes to a roller coaster he goes to amusement park and goes to a roller coaster 
A person who will feel nausea and vomiting will say, the evaluation will be, I don't want to sit in the roller coaster again. But a person who enjoys it by his or her prakriti will say, I want to sit in the roller coaster again. So the trial and error method and learning is also dependent on the prakriti of a person. But that is one of the methods, trial and error. <coughs> Another method is conditional responses. When we have one condition, we respond in that way. When we have other condition, we respond in the other way. <coughs> and we learn it. Simple example is, we forget the, say for example, winter jacket. We come, we think that, okay, uh, the weather looks good, it is shiny, we come out. And we experience a cold. Oh, it is very cold. Go, go, we go inside and we wear a winter jacket. A, a condition made us to do a learning. Next time, we will wear the winter jacket while coming out. A, another excellent example and experiment done is on the dome. There was a dog, uh, 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 the scientists have done this experiment. To feed a dog, a dog is hungry, you feed the dog, but you do not allow the dog to eat the food unless you ring a bell. So you ring a bell and now dog will eat the food. Then you do it again, one day, two day, five, three, one month, two month, three months. Now dog has got a reference, what is called as a conditional response. The go dog has got a reference that when the bell rings, then the food is, I am supposed to eat the food. Until, even if the dog is extremely hungry, <coughs> even if the dog is having the food in front of him, the dog will not eat the food unless the bell is rung. So there is a reference. What is called as a, in uh, other languages, it is other method, is called as a trigger point. A person is very calm. Uh, there is a story about a, a, a funny story. There is a story about a, 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 a pundit. He was telling that I am having my mind in equilibrium. I have achieved the intellectual equilibrium. I never become angry. Yeah. I never become angry. He used to claim it. And people used to see he is never becoming angry. <coughs> so he went to one village. And uh, people were telling, oh, we got a pundit. He never gets angry. Uh, this is a very great thing. He has achieved the control on his anger. So there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a jovial person in the village. He told that, okay, let me see. Let me check it. <coughs> see, this is also happening. Sometimes people do not achieve themselves, but they want to check other people whether they achieved or not. That is a funny part of the world. Anyway, so he goes to that uh, Pandit and he says, oh, Panditji, I understood that you never become angry. He says, yes, I never become any angry in any situation. I have achieved the intellectual equilibrium. Hmm. <coughs> so he says, okay, uh, Panditji, what's your name, by the way? So uh, suppose any name, he says that my name is Anand. So Anand Shastri. So he says, okay, fine. So uh, he, then he talks again, oh, Panditji, where you live? And then he's asking, by the way, Panditji, what's your name? And he says, my name is Anand. And then again some conversation and again this guy asking, Panditji, what's your name? And he's telling, I told you my name, my name is Anand. And the conversation goes further and he's asking pan the Pandit 15 times, same question. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And the Pandit becomes angry. I told you my name, why are you asking me name again and again? So that was a trigger point for the Pandit. So a conditional response means in, in normal condition, you see a person very good. But in a trigger point, when the things trigger, the person goes into a spin. And we have seen it. That is why we say in families and other things, Are isko chedna mat, isko ye mat bolna. Don't tell this, don't tell that. Yeah, mostly the wives are doing it. Mostly the wives knows how, the, how and when the husband becomes angry. Yeah, he will become mad. So, do not do that. They will tell all the kids also, don't do this, your father will become angry. Because they know, they know the conditional response, they know the trigger point of the husband. And in the same way, even to make happy also. Not anger and all, always happy also. If I cook this food, he will become happy. So if I want, say for example, I want a gold ring, I will cook some nice food and then I will ask for a gold ring. Wives are very intelligent. They are very intelligent in understanding this, this conditional response point. How do we learn from conditional response? Then third part of learning is insight. Learning by insight. 
So in insight, what happens that when the results are evaluated, we look at the results and by intuition, by insight of that, evaluation can be done in two ways. One is the materialistic return, what is achieved and not achieved, and another is by intuition, whether it is really good or not. Sometimes the conditions are to be evaluated not only the base of the returns and the advantages, but, but also the, the ethic, ethicity of it, whether it is ethical to do it, whether it is moral uh, way, way to do it, how will it go uh, and change in the society? How will it impact the society? How will it impact the future generation? These are the decisions to be taken by and we do the evaluation. So in such cases, the intuition, the learning from insight is important. And the third way of learning is evaluating the situation and results with the insight. Some people have got better insight than the other people. And development of insight is in two ways. Number one, we have to keep thinking inside ourselves. Chintan, manan, and manthan. What is in Sanskrit we say? I do not know how we can explain that word in English, but chintan, ma manan, and manthan, meditation, we can say in other words. So we learn by that. And another learning is by imitation, copying. We copy the people. We see somebody <coughs> and we like whatever they got <coughs> in the, as a result. <coughs> then we do the same thing. Now we, <coughs> we try to imitate a person. If somebody has opened up a shop, a convenience shop in an area, and they are making good money, then I think that I also want to make good money. So I'll open up a convenience store in another area. We try to copy and imitate. This is the largest uh, um, uh, learning method for, for humans for thousands of years. Thousands of years. A human can copy, an animal does not copy. This, somebody, somebody will ask, this is a very important part. How does the animal learn? Animal learn by either instinct or by the, uh, the, uh, uh, the other one, the conditional response. Like a tiger is uh, standing on two legs, you know, a conditional response. Because I will get a piece of meat, so I will stand on my two legs. But, but the animals does not learn by imitation. When a tiger is jumping on a deer and killing it, all the deer see it for thousands of years, but they never thought that, okay, we are 100 in number, we have got all the horns, and if a tiger comes, we can all 100, you know, go and dash into the tiger, and tiger will run away. It hardly happens. Generally, it never happens. Why? Because they cannot copy the way the tiger is fighting. They do not copy that, that let us fight in the same way. They go by the instinct. Tiger means run away. So even if there are 1,000 deer, and there is only one tiger, all those thousand years will never retaliate because they go by the instinct. But human learns by copying. Human learned how the bird is flying and we made the aeroplanes with the wings. Yeah, we made the wings. We, we copied everything from the Prakuti, we copied and we are still copying it. We are trying to see, we evaluate it, oh, whether we can copy this, whether we can copy this. And we copy it and then we go further. Science has mainly, mainly done all the inventions through the method of copying, the human has done. And then trial and error, so it is a combination of By copying, learning by imitation. And one another way is learning by transfer training. In other words, you, one person has learnt it and they explain to the other person, a human being. Because both are human being, a other person can learn the same techniques and this thing is nothing but the whole education system. The teachers are trained and then the teachers train the students. <coughs> so uh, one person is trained and that person is doing what is called as a transfer training. <coughs> Transferring, transfer of the training means transfer of the knowledge and experiences to the other person, like a ready dish. The person need not to go through the trial and error method, the person need not to look into insight, but they just copy it. And this works for masses. If we want, say, 5,000 accountants, the way to get 5,000 accountants is by education, by training. And in this training, there are other subsections like, by, like visual, oral conversation, and all those technology parts. 
but overally it is transfer of training <coughs> so these are the five ways we are learning <coughs> now why we talked about this five learning method because when we are doing the intellectual where remember we were talking about the uh, uh, samadha achala and we were talking about the alluring of the vedas when we are doing any karma kat whenever we are doing it <coughs> try to learn from this five methods try to learn try to understand what it means rather than simply aaj jod ke baith ke aankh band karke baithna try to understand from it and trying to understanding this will build our intellect and um, the, it will be able to understand the true meaning behind it so that we will not be allured by it in the example of the uh, of the the surya namaskar we are doing the same thing but we are not allured that oh i will do this because my health will improve i'll do this because this will happen we are doing it for the sake of doing it we are doing it for the love of the god surya we are not going to leave it remember i am telling very clearly we are not going to leave the rituals we are not going to leave the karma kand we are going to do it with better understanding we are going to do it better let us take two example we see that on the lord shiva on the god bhagwan shiva we have got that uh, pot on the top which is dropping one by one drop one drop second drop you know slowly slowly continuously dropping we are dropping the water on the shiva linga we are put dropping the water on shiva linga why why do we do it now there will be puranas so many there will be stories they will say oh you should put water and this and that so if you have to put water why not to put a you know a complete pot of water continuous why not to put a tap on the top of it and just keep the tap open so it will just gush of water below or some people will say that oh it will be a lot of waste of water okay then put a pump and just circulate the water so there will be no water waste why it is drop by drop the reason is because bhagwan shiva is the god of wisdom god of knowledge shiva bhagwan gyan ke devta hai and how does the gyan how does the knowledge how does how do we understand as the best drop by drop we cannot a, a child cannot become cannot be made phd on day 1 a child has to learn through the drop by drop process a b c they will learn the alphabets then slowly they will learn the mathematics and and then eventually they will grow into that so this is a symbol that the gyana will come drop by drop patience shiva kanta sambho ha ah, very shant shiva is very shant shiva is very peaceful why because if you want to achieve any gyana in the life you can take it only drop by drop and be peaceful if our mind is not peaceful and we think that okay today i am going to rush to the whole book we will not remember it gyana needs lots of patience lots of time and lots of hard work and that is why gyana is sitting on a bull bull represents the hard work extreme hard work bull represents that a person should work so hard then only he or she can achieve gyana and that also will come drop by drop so when we are now seeing the shiva and we see the drops try to understand keep patience if i want to achieve any knowledge if i want to achieve anything in my life it will come drop by drop it will not come in a gush of water it will not come with a flooded water it will come drop by drop that is what the gyana is that is why a gyan ke devta will have the waters dropping one by one drop that is representing us when we see that we will when when we then pray it we will understand every day reminding ourselves we talked about it here right we talked about it that learning by imitation and learning all these five learning methods when we do any karma kand apply all these five learning methods and then we will be able to understand remind us oh shiva is gyan ka devta shiva is you know uh, is drop by drop so if i want to achieve something in my life i will to work hard and keep patience and it will come drop by drop when that comes into our mind every day reminding every day doing the shiva puja 
every day reminding and every day doing, doing Shiva Puja, our mind will be trained. When the trained mind, even in the, in the material world also, we will be able to keep patience. Anything which is coming uh, adverse or anything which is unable, we are unable to understand as far as the jnana is concerned, we will not be impatient. We will be patient. We will be able to work hard towards it drop by drop, one by one step, one step at a time. It is what it is representing. So when it is telling samadha achala means understanding and not getting allured by the Vedas, the fruity part of the Veda. Because Vedas are telling fruity part also. Shankar Bhagwan ki puja karenge, ye ho jayega. Kaise ho jayega? How will it happen? This is how it happens. Shankar Bhagwan ki puja karo, shanti milegi. Aapka chandra bura hai, your chandra is bad. So you wear a chandra ka viti, anguti, moti. Why viti? Oh, what will viti do? Viti will remind me, oh, you know what? I am supposed to be patient. I, I should, I am supposed to be patient, I have to main, maintain patience. It will remind you when you are wearing the ring. So it is not the ring, but it is a reminder of that thing in your mind. And then eventually your brain is trained and you say, oh, when, since I am wearing the ring, I am having a patience develop, I am slowly becoming cooler. It is not the anguti, it is the impact of the intellect through this five learning method. So, going at the extreme stage, when we are going to the extreme stage the, um, of learning, which is Atma Jnana. Atma Jnana is the highest level of education. When we achieve that education, then all other things, the Vedic alluring, the alluring by the Karma Kand, ye karo ho jayega, this, you do this, it will be good, you do that, it will be good to have good happening to you, that alluring will go. The purpose of the Karma Kand is not to develop the alluring, but to remove the alluring. Unfortunately, in many cases, we say that every karma kand is towards more increase of alluring. And God is trying to tell that here very clearly, that remove the alluring, the fruity part of the, uh, of the Vedas has to come out of you, detach from that. God is telling here, when your intellect ceases to be allured by the fruity sections of the Vedas. So actually, those things are supposed to remove our uh, uh, allurance from the fruity part of the Vedas and that is the purpose of Karmakand. Doing Karmakand is important, doing Karmakand should be continued, but how to do it and its impact on ourselves has to be corrected. That is what it is telling here. Another example is uh, the uh, Bhagwan uh, Ganapati. We put the uh, flower of hibiscus on it and we say that, oh, you know, Rakta Ganda no Liptangam, Rakta Pushpai Sukujitam in Gadapati Atharva Shirsham, we say that. Rakta Ganda no Liptangam, Rakta Pushpai Sukujitam. We have to put a Rakta Pushpa, Rakta means red. So we say, okay, we will put the hibiscus flower to the Ganapati and we say that we have prayed it. What it means? Ganapati means the king, Ganoka Pati, the leader, the people who represent the nation. In other words, representation of the nation. And how can you do the puja of a nation? By giving your blood, by working hard. The nation, the patriotism needs blood. We are all happy and comfortable here because there are people putting their blood on the borders of the nation. So when you want to serve the society, when you want to serve the nation, you are supposed to put your jivana pushpa, your, the, the flower of your life, with a rakta. That is what is rakta ganda no liptangam, rakta pushpai sukujidam. So when we put the hibiscus flower at the feet of the Lord Ganesha, we are committing, I will be a patriotic person. I am ready to shed my blood for the purpose of the nation. That is the commitment. When we pray like that, we will be more developing more better patriotism in our, in our children and ourselves. That is what it means. In other words, what I want, we can keep on continuing because Karmakand is a long list and we can keep understanding all those. But point is that when we do the Karmakand, don't get allured by the fruity actions, but get into connection and development of intellect into an equilibrium. That is the purpose of the 
our uh, rituals. That is exactly how it is. And that is why we say, Rakta Ganda no Liptangam, in case of Ganapati. And in every ritual, in every ritual, this is the reason. The development of intellect, the stability, the steadfastness of the intellect is the purpose, is the actual result expected out of all this karma kanda, all these rituals. Expected result is not the fruitive action of the karma kanda. That is what God is telling here very clearly. So, uh, uh, the, and it is difficult. So, can everybody do this? Can are everybody is that much intelligent and in, 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 intellectually uh, stable and strong to do that? Is it applicable to everyone? These are the questions going to come. So uh, when we come next Saturday, uh, we will meet again at uh, 10 o'clock, and we will think about this. That is it. Uh, this theory, this whole thing, is is it applicable to everyone? Some people intellect is different than other people. Uh, 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 you know, their prakruti is different. How does this uh, uh, apply to every level of intellect? And that we are going to discuss next time. So till then, I wish everyone a good uh, weekend. And uh, we will meet again on next Saturday at uh, 10 to 11 at uh, Jai Durga Temple here. Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kansa Chanu Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Sri Guru Vini